It's time for the ultimate review, as the byword this week travels back in time to the very first volume of The Ultimates. Does it hold up? We'll find out today. Ladies and gentlemen, nerds, welcome to episode 151 of the Nerd Byword Podcast. I'm Dave. I'm here with my buddy Chris. And this week, we are taking a step back into the early 2000s and checking out uh, the first volume of The Ultimates, which has been often touted as a major inspiration behind the MCU. Uh, let's see if we can make some of those connections and just generally see if uh, the first volume of this series actually holds up today. But first, as always, it is time for... Nerd News! Chris, uh, this is really bad news, so uh, hit me. Yeah, so the Writers Guild of America, the WGA, has almost unanimously, 98% of, of the guild, voted to go on strike as negotiations have broken down with all of the big... Uh, production companies and streamers and what have you. Um, so if you're uh, of a certain age like ourselves, you'll remember like when this happened in 2007 and the biggest kind of results out of that was we went and got a lot of unscripted television. That was, you know, reality t television was already kind of present. You had things like Survivor uh, and and the like, but you know, w when you had a writer's strike and there's no scripted television, they uh, the production companies naturally went whole hog into reality television. And so um, the biggest point of contention now, um, 15 years later, is that the advent of streaming um, has completely changed the, the landscape and the uh, the major corporations that are making record profits are unwilling to share uh, those that wealth with the people who are creating the products that we love and enjoy. Um, one of my favorite shows of the past year, not necessarily a nerdy show, so I haven't nerd commended it, but um, The Bear on Hulu, is um, an FX Hulu, um, has been a fantastic, fantastic show to watch. Um, I always was a big fan of the Gordon Ramsay shows um, uh, over the past decade or so, and so seeing that, you know, lifestyle in a restaurant, um, almost from like a first person perspective was fascinating. Um, and it was award winning one writers guild awards for best comedy. Um, and one of the chief writers on that, um, had a negative bank account and had to borrow a tux or rely on a tux being bought for him from family and friends and bought, um, his bow tie to go to this award ceremony on a credit card. Uh, because he did not have enough money. Uh, he was relying on a space heater in his Brooklyn apartment, um, which would mess with his electricity and shortage out. Then he would have to go to the public library to write one of the most popular, one of the most critically acclaimed, well-received shows that we saw in the past year. Um, you see similar stories of the writers of Adabit Elementary, one of the smash hit shows of the past year as well. Uh, one of my favorites. And so... Um, it's just it's just really sad to see. And unfortunately, not all that surprising when you have Lex Luthor himself, David Zaslav, saying that the love for work is going to have these writers come back to work and just forget the fact that they're not being fairly compensated, that they're having to seek further employment. They're having to rely on donations to their Venmo and PayPal. Um, Alex O'Keefe, the writer that I mentioned earlier, um, went on one of my other favorite podcasts, the Dan Lebitard show and the fans and listeners, you know, made donations to his, his Venmo because he's out of work right now. And um, you have to admire the willingness of these writers to go on strike, especially in the, the kind of gig kind of um, culture that they live in um, where, you know, you see, you might get a decent amount of cash writing for a show, but you don't know when your next gig is going to be. Um, so I, I truly hope 
and pray that um, the writers have their demands met. Um, and I'm willing to wait on content. There are some people already saying, freaking out that the next Marvel movie or DC movie is going to be delayed or put on hold. Um, but as much as I love those properties, it pales in comparison to fair compensation for justice. Um, I think it's a disingenuous argument for you to sit there and claim to be a fan of superheroes and justice and doing the right thing. And then to know that these people are not receiving fair compensation um, because that's the right thing to do is to pay these people for the work that they've done to create these things that you love. Um, and this is something that we've always had strong feelings about on this show. And I'm, I'm proud of that fact. Um, another scary point of contention is the use of AI. You already see headlines and that was already in the negotiations, but you see now that the writers are on strike. You have rumblings um, from certain media outlets that companies and corporations are willing to look into artificial intelligence because of course uh rather than pay people they'd rather resort to ai and soulless content uh it it just it just blows my mind so we proudly stand here at the nerd by word in solidarity with the writers guild all of the creatives as creators ourselves um and we hope uh, all the success in the world for them. Yeah, um, I don't think I can add much more to that other than uh, screw AI. <laughs> like, um, I didn't know that we we're going to get to the point so quickly that uh, companies, you know, big corporations feel like they can, uh, you know, replace human creators with, uh, you know, computers. But apparently we're already at that point. Uh, and so I'll make the bold stance, which I don't think is a bold stance, and say that as as you know, a creator myself, that I have absolutely no interest, even as a consumer, uh, of interacting with um, creative endeavors that are generated by AI. I prefer the human touch, and I have I will categorically just not um, interact with AI uh, generated um, writing in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you can forget that I'm just not doing it. So, um, you know, best of luck to these writers. This is uh, this is a bold step, obviously, and it's probably going to take some time. Uh, that's the big one to remember. I think the last writers' strike uh, lasted about a hundred days. So, so this is definitely uh, probably going to you know be a long haul kind of situation. Um, and as far as not getting content, I, I had to laugh, but I, I kind of agree with uh, Jason Schreier, a, um, a video game journalist. Uh, he used to be over at Kotaku and now writes for Bloomberg. Um, but he tweeted something to the effect of, uh, um, you know, we're not going to have a, a content problem because the new Legend of Zelda is getting ready to come out. So everybody, <laughs> every, everybody will be busy playing that anyway. So don't don't worry about, you know, TV and movies right now. Uh, we're, we're, we're good. OK, we got the new Zelda coming out. Relax. <laughs> so I just got Redfall. I've got so many comic books to read. Like, nope, I'm good. Yeah, so I, I think I think we will be just fine. Yeah, and I think th like one of <laughs> one of the biggest observations I've had over this entire ordeal, and I think I think Dave, honestly, it's it's kind of a push right now because we love dunking on Elon Musk for like the catastrophic failure that his Twitter takeover has been, but I think David Zaslav could be giving him a run for his forty four billion dollar purchase, <laughs> like. The man must have a foot fetish because his foot is in his mouth ninety percent of the time when he when he opens it. It's just hey, there's some yo. weird go there is some weird going on there. That man cannot say something that seems coherent in any I way, mean, shape, or form. And it's and it's just proof positive of how out of touch and out of base like he is. Because they're trying to pay they're trying to play this the game like we're still in the nineties and we're relying on residuals like when you had like reruns and syndication, like we're in, we're in the, the streaming age. Like it doesn't work that way. So they're trying to pay them residuals. Like it's still 1994. Yep. All right, Dave, we go from bad news to bad news. Yeah, that's one way to put it. So um, th this is, uh, I, I don't think anybody is going to have particularly strong feelings about the studio involved in this story, but I think the trend is uh, troubling. So Sony has apparently quietly closed down Pixel Opus, 
uh, one of its first party PlayStation Studios, uh, which was based in San Mateo, California. Um, so there's been a couple of games that uh, the studio has to their credit. It's a really small studio. I think there's about 20 people or so that were involved here. Uh, they released uh, in 2014 a game called Entwined. Uh, and then in 2019, a game that was a critically very well received Concrete Genie. Um, now, uh, the, the studio itself on their official Twitter uh, posted that, you know, the journey has come to, to an end and then uh, PlayStation, uh, yeah, so Sony basically uh, confirmed to IGN that the um, studio will close as of June 2nd. Um, so what's what's interesting about this is that Pixel Opus is one of those small experimental studios, right? Uh, they, they don't do triple A game development, these huge, you know, cinematic uh, experiences that Sony has become more and more well known for lately, um, and by all accounts, the, the studio had some incredibly talented people that were uh, you know mucking about and in, in trying some experimental things and, and you know trying new things. Um, uh, the last report was that they were working on some kind of project with Sony Pictures Animation, even, um, and that that's probably going to go out the window now. Whatever that would have been. Um, and it's interesting because it's not the only studio uh, in the last few years that's sort of smaller and more experimental that's been shut down by Sony. Uh, back in 2021, there was Japan Studio that was shut down as well. And uh, so industry uh, insiders and, and games journalists that cover this field you know, frequently uh, have been sort of indicating that Sony is in the middle of a hard pivot towards prestige blockbusters at all costs. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm kind of troubled by this trend because although I'm a big fan of, you know, big productions like, you know, the Horizon games, for example, I also like that there's, you know, a whole bunch of smaller studios that get support from, from you know, Sony and from Microsoft to experiment and try new things and make these smaller scale um experiences right so if sony is really pivoting away from that and all we're going to get from them is these incredibly expensive long development cycle uh triple a blockbuster kind of games and we're not getting these these smaller more bite-sized experiences in between the kind of um you know scratch a different kind of gaming itch then uh, i think that is a very 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 bad decision long term for sony yeah and you know it, it just sends a date. I think it sets a dangerous precedent. You know, I don't, I don't interact much with Sony content, of course, but I think, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not good news for like the future of gaming. And, and this is kind of over like an overarching thing when it comes to major studios, they're kind of gobbling up these little, little developers. They kind of create these like indie hits and like, for the most part, I'm like a big kind of consumer, but like there are some indie stuff that kind of breaks through and it like kind of catches fire. And I think that's a, that's a troubling thing to see. Yeah. I'm, I just, you know, I love, you know, the, the, the like I said, like the big experiences, like a, a legend of Zelda or horizon zero dawn or forbidden West or whatnot. But I also play really small scale, you know, more indie games that I really, really enjoy and, and seeing, you know, the indie market in, in gaming is, I would say, in some ways akin to, um, you know, the comic book market. You know, it's, it's you have you have your big publishers and then you have these little tiny companies just t kind of toiling away, making these real labors of love and in a crowded market struggling to, to you know, gain attention. So having smaller uh, developmental studios like like this that gets some support and some exposure from a Sony or a Microsoft is a, is a net good thing, I think. Um, and, you know, with the influx of, of money and the influx of, of just plain visibility, you know, I mean, that's the big one. Uh, it's incredible how many games fly completely under the radar um, just because you, you just never really exposed to them. You don't know that they're an option or what that they're out there. Um, you have to really make an effort to find some of these gems. And so th this pivot is, is incredibly sad in my book. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the things that I appreciate about, uh, about something like game pass and not to just be like the evangelist for Microsoft, but like a lot of those indie developed games are 
put on Game Pass, and like that's such a great platform for them. And you know, I'll half the time, like uh, you know, the kids will want like a new game, and we'll just kind of scroll through the catalog of Game Pass, and one of those indie games they just fall in love with. And I think that's that's something that we want to continue, and we should continue to encourage. Absolutely. All right, folks, there you have it. That's it for uh, this week's nerd news. We'd love to hear your comments on these new stories. What are your thoughts? You can hit us up on uh, Twitter and Instagram at NerdPowerWord or individually at that nerd Dave and at that nerd Chris. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dive into uh, the Ultimates uh, and whether this particular comic book still holds up today. So stick around. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentle nerds, it's time for this week's And boy, oh boy, do we have a doozy. We're going to be looking at uh, The Ultimates Volume 1, uh, written by Mark Miller, with art by Brian Hitch. Uh, the book came out in the early 2000s, has been uh, credited repeatedly for laying uh, some foundational ideas that would uh, eventually become uh, the MCU, um, and reimagines uh, the story of the Avengers uh, in the Ultimate Universe. Now, for those of you that are not super versed, the Ultimate Universe was sort of a... Uh, alternate universe to the mainline uh, Marvel comic book universe where uh, everything sort of got restarted with a more modern take. Uh, The breakout hit uh, was obviously uh, uh, Brian Michael Bendis' Ultimate Spider-Man, which then, you know, received multiple spinoffs. We ended up getting Ultimate Fantastic Four, the Ultimates as their take on the Avengers, and so on and so forth. Uh, Currently, the publishing line is defunct, but we are cruising for a big crossover uh, that Marvel is getting ready to pu- uh, put out that uh, re- is reputedly bringing the Ultimate Universe back in some way, shape, or form. So it's the perfect time to take a look back at one of the foundational stories for the Ultimate Universe, which is, of course, the Ultimates. Uh, we're going to treat this book the way we treat our movie reviews, which means we are picking three likes and three dislikes each. And then we're going to kind of bring it all home with our overall grade and thoughts on the series. So let's start with the things we liked, Chris. Uh, What did you enjoy about uh, Miller and Hitch's The Ultimates Volume 1? Well, I just want to preface this because this is not at all the experience that I expected. My my experience, you know, as a Johnny-come-lately to reading comics and, you know, the, the Ultimate Universe as well, was through the pen of of Jonathan Hickman. And so the first time I had read the Ultimates was his, you know, in the 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 last gasps of the Ultimate Universe when he was writing it uh, al- alongside uh, Asad Ribich on art. So I had a very different kind of sense of what the Ultimates were. I was very much like gung ho, like yes, all right, and you know, I'm excited for Brian Hitch and Jonathan Hickman to return in Ultimate Evasion. Um, this hit me like a slap in the face. This was markedly different to my experience with the Ultimates before. Um, I also did some background research, and um, not only do the screenwriters of the 2012 Avengers film credit this as like the source material for it, but Time Magazine called it the comic book of the decade. So, like, I saw that going in, and then I read the actual stuff and was Wow. The first thing that I had to like was Thor. I think that the reinterpretation of this character um, was really, really interesting. Um, There were aspects of it that I was kind of indifferent or meh on, but overarchingly kind of, if I understood this correctly, as like a reincarnation of Thor was really fascinating. Um, and the, the subsequent ultimate Thor comics that I read by Hickman, I, I really enjoyed as well, uh, at the time Uh, it's been, it's been several years, but I think that this like hippie version of Thor was really interesting. Um, and one of the criticisms of the MCU is like the glorification of the military industrial complex and for Thor to kind of rail against that. Um, 
by specifically saying the military industrial complex two or three times within these 13 issues was really fascinating to see. Um, it was also kind of troubling how quickly his principles kind of went out the window. Um, but aesthetically Thor was far and away my favorite part of these 13 issues. Yeah. Hippie Thor that really doesn't want to get involved, but just kind of likes Tony Stark. It's literally me. It's just me. (laughs) He's like, he he even at one point, like looks at Nick Fury and it's like, don't give me orders, dude. I'm just here as a favor to Stark. I'm not one of your soldiers. And I, I really like that. uh, I really like that approach. Uh, I I, I like also also the friendship, the friendship between him and Tony was unexpected. uh, And it was appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say, um, as as somebody who um, is very sympathetic to a lot of the things Thor said, um, he, he kind of came across a little um, condescending, I guess, sometimes in that mm-hmm. sense. Which, of course, you know, is 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 consistent. You know, he thinks he's a god or is a god. I mean, that's that's another interesting thing about this version of a character is that everybody's walking around basically saying, "Dude, you're a nurse who had a nervous breakdown. I don't know where you got the hammer, but you're just nuts, right?" And that was a really cool that was a really cool take on the character. I think that, in and of itself, is fascinating. They that the entire everyone around him thinks that he's just mental. That's fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely adore that. You know, that that they're like, we, we're going to use you because you're incredibly powerful, but you're nuts. OK, you're not a god. That's all a bunch of crap. You know, like, I really like that. And it's never it doesn't give you a, a straight up answer. I, I think that's what I probably like about it the best, that you come out of this and you're still not 100 percent sure if he's just nuts or if he's actually, an, uh, you know, an Asgardian god. So that that was a really, really cool take on the character. Which is something I kind of now, kind of hindsight, I was like, I wish we kind of would have had that more in the MCU. Yeah, he got he got accepted very quickly on 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 yeah. at face value. Yeah, like okay, he's he's from Asgard, sure, whatever. Um, but people saying, yeah, this guy's nuts would have been a lot more interesting. I guess in a world where you have Giant Man and the Hulk, like everybody's just like, all right, let's just roll with it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Okay, accepted. <laughs> All right, Dave, uh, I think this is objectively the the strongest thing about these 13 issues. Yeah, and, you know, I think uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, is, is a very tired comment at this point, but I'm going to say it anyways because it applies very well here. Brian Hitch's back must have been hurting a lot drawing the series because he was carrying. Um, even when I was not enjoying some of the choices made in the writing, this was a very beautiful book to look at with very interesting um, visual ideas too. Some of the redesigns of the characters were um, were subtle, but interesting. Um, and, and others were, were not as subtle and still interesting. Like visually <laughs> speaking, this was, this was a very, very interesting look. Like even Ultimate Thor, just to get back to him, his look was very understated in this and still recognizably Thor. And I thought that was a very cool... Um, you know, toned down approach, I guess, you know, that, that was very, very cool. So visually speaking, I think um, this was a very, very gorgeous book and, and I cannot fault the art in this in any way, shape or form. I love everything about Thor's look, except for his hair. It looks like a bad toupee. Other (laughs) than that, like I love everything, everything about his look. The hammer looks awesome. Like the, the glowing, circles on his chest are really really cool um but yeah this is what this was like um, almost like my coping mechanism was brian hitch's art and to see him attached to return with jonathan hickman is very very exciting to me um for ultimate invasion um but yeah it, it, it was it was very inspired the art um like even like you said, some of the directions. Like I'll get so to more of that in some of my dislikes. Even if it was like a, just a terrible direction to go from the writing perspective and the action and the plot was taking. At least it looked good. <laughs> that 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 is exactly right. At least it was good to look at. Yeah, I think um, as far as Ultimate Invasion is concerned, the choice of bringing Hitch back because he has a very distinctive art style, and I think he really put a stamp on the Ultimates here, uh, visually speaking. Um, was very very smart, um, and and not bringing Miller back as much as that is sad to say. I'm totally okay with. <laughs> like I'm definitely um, I, okay with that. 
I, I don't think uh, we'll we'll get into the writing here in a little bit, but I don't think the writing was the strongest suit of this particular series. I needed Brian Hitch. I needed Brian Hitch to be a consultant on that uh, Avengers 2012 Captain America suit because <laughs> his Captain <laughs> America suit was much better than what we got in the film. That's that's totally fair. I think. Alrighty, so Chris, what is your second like of uh, the Ultimates? Spoiler alert, I really struggled to find some likes. Um, but it has all the potential in the world. Like, I really wanted to love this. Um, it was a really interesting idea. Um, similar to the... Also, I'm coming off the heels of... Not off the heels, because it's been years. But, like, I just, I just genuinely love almost everything about Ultimate Spider-Man. And so, kind of playing in this sandbox of... 21st century interpretations of superheroes is fascinating to me and it has all the potential in the world the execution leaves a lot to be desired but um and maybe that's what i like about what hickman was able to do later on but i think um and why i'm excited to return to this universe because it's just all the potential in the world and it's such an interesting thing and i just wish it was executed better this sounds like a dislike but i really just enjoyed like hmm i could envision myself in this universe yeah and i think uh ultimate spider-man in a lot of ways is sort of the um the the, the ideal um reinvention mo- sort of modernization quote-unquote of a comic book property i think uh it kind of was able to maintain the heart and soul of a character um and a and a you know a setup um and a concept while still you know doing some different things with it um and this i don't think any of the characters really you know the heart and soul of those characters were really captured in this i guess um so yeah, I would say potential. All in all, the potential in the world is a fair assessment because again, uh, Ultimate Spider-Man did it so very, very well. We know it can be executed uh, expertly, um, even if this was not. And I think that maybe that's an unfair comparison, but at the same time, we have to hold the writing accountable for what it is. And in the interest of not jumping the shark on in, in, into the dislike section, Dave, hurry up and give us your second like. <laughs> <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> okay, let me let me let me hurry. hurry up. <laughs> I uh, I'm I'm going to be probably um, you know flogged for this take online, but I never really connected very well with the Nick Fury character. Um, in the 616 like uh nick fury is the white one (laughs) yeah the 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 the, the cracker fury um (laughs) i've i've never really connected with nick fury as a character he seemed i don't know like very bland such a caricature he's such a caricature very much so it's it you know i think there's something to be said that if you if you want to see the most accurate portrayal of comic book 616 nick nick fury you need to look at the movie featuring david hasselhoff because i think that's actually fairly accurate representation of what the character has been depicted like in in the comic books in the 616 and so this this nick fury is is awesome like i I find him to be a much more interesting character um he is uh, not always in control, although he certainly tries to project that. He has his doubts. Uh, he expresses those very clearly in places, especially when they uh, when Captain America loosens the Hulk at the end. Um, Nick Fury makes some kind of comment about how he's you know he's filling up his pants or something because he's so scared. <laughs> like this is a very different kind of Nick Fury. And yes, it, uh, it, you know we know that uh, you know it, it's very much a look inspired by Samuel Jackson to the point where they even comment on that. Uh, in the book itself, uh, when the Ultimates are sitting around talking about who should play them in any movie adaptation. And he says, well, Samuel L. Jackson, obviously. Uh, And then that's what we got in the MCU. It's probably one of the most direct comparisons, one of the most direct lines between this book and the MCU. Um, And and maybe that has something to do with it, that you know, I'm kind of used to the whole idea of a Samuel L. Jackson-style Nick Fury at this point. But... Uh, even back then, I recall when it was when it was first coming out, I liked this Nick Fury. I thought he was an interesting character from the word go, which is a lot more than I can say for 616 Nick Fury. I just never really connected with that character. So I thought this was a really good positive change. Yeah, I've, I've never connected um, 
Like I was happy when original sin hap and uh, original sin happened. Like, yeah, you can go away. Like, of course, you did something awful, uh, White Nick Fury, because you're a caricature, like a cigar chomping guy. Like he's just such a caricature of what a military man is. And I think that this version and, you know, in turn, Nick, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's version of Nick Fury is just so much more like believable with like the kind of covert ops, you know, infusions and everything. So it's a much more believable character. Um, and, you know, obviously you see the direct correlations with the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, for good reason. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chris, that brings us to your uh, third and final like of the series. Sunday, May 7th, 10.53 a.m. I like Tony Stark here. Like, what is this? <laughs> like, more on more on the dialogue later. Like, of course, you know, this is with a caveat. But I found myself liking Tony Stark as a character. And it wasn't just because Robert Downey Jr. Uh, more on that in a moment as well. But I think I think he came across as really sympathetic. And that's something that 616 kind of struggles with even to this day. I think I think uh, we talked about this in our spring cleaning episode. I think a lot of, you know, 616 Tony Stark comes across as like a bad karaoke version of RDJ now. And so um, there's, I, I don't know if we should spoil this for a comic that's been around for 20 years, but if you haven't read it, spoiler alert. You know, like the cancer diagnosis, and he doesn't know how much longer he has to live. And that kind of, I don't know if it kind of gives some enlightenment on like the playboy aspect of the character. But it's definitely interesting. And it definitely took me by surprise where I was siding with this guy. And how he was, he was scared. And he was relatable for that, you know, you can have all the money in the world and you're still staving off an alien invasion. You're scared out of your suit, as it were. Um, so, yeah, I that, this was probably the biggest surprise is I came away really liking Tony here. And now that I think about it, I really like what Hickman did with him as well in the Ultimate Universe. Yeah, I, th I, I think Tony is one of the, um, you know, T Tony is an interesting case. Uh, I I'm going to talk later a little bit about my take generally on the characters across the board in this book. And I think Tony is one of those characters that you expect to be a little bit of a butthole. Um, that's just who he that's just part of who he is. But here, at least he's a very humanized butthole I, th I think that's what it comes in a down world to here. where everyone is <laughs> exactly in a world where everyone is a butthole he is the most human of buttholes um you you kind of sympathize with you know the cancer diagnosis not knowing where you know how long he still has left um he has a great moment in the final battle where he's like i can't do this you know and somebody says to him you know, well, if if not you, who? You know, and then he kind of yes. pulls himself together, and it's that that's a great, great moment for a Tony Stark, somebody who's so full of himself at all times to be humbled by the situation, and then still pull himself up by his bootstraps and and do what needs to be done. That was a great moment for the character. So I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to say that that he's likable. He's still a uh, you know an 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 arrogant little butt, but um, he is uh, I would say. The, the most humanized of the characters in this book, I think. You know what was really funny with with that regard, now that you made me think of it, is I immediately... And it's really interesting because this was written in 2002, 2003, and then we had the Avengers in 2012. And they explicitly said, oh, Tony, you're going to make the heroic sacrifice, like he does in 2012's Avengers. And like pushes the Chitari bomb thing or whatever through that portal. You remember that? But yep. then it turns it on its head. It's like, no, Thor's going to teleport it to this dead and forsaken world. So <laughs> I was just like, how, how does that work? Because you completely, <laughs> like the timelines don't match up for me to be surprised by that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was, that was neat. 
All right, your final like here, Dave, before we set up camp. It's interesting because I think there are glimmers here. I think this ties a little bit in with your idea of potential uh, for the series. It has glimmers of really interesting character interpretations, you know, and, and we've hinted at a lot of these, you know, Tony uh, having this cancer diagnosis and trying to work through how he's going to use the time he has left is, is really interesting. Um, Nick Fury, uh, you know, being a little more human and uh, drawn a little more interestingly as, as a, as a human being. I think that was really interesting. Hippie Thor, quite interesting, right? But then uh, th- there is a bigger problem here, right? Uh, and we'll get to that in uh, in in one of my dislikes uh, later. Uh, but there's just these glimmers of really interesting interpretations. If the writing would have not made some absolutely awful choices along the way, um, I could have had a lot of fun with the series. I think there's just glimmers of really good stuff here. Um, but rather than leaning into the really good stuff it leans into some of the, the absolute worst that this, this series has to offer instead. It's just leaning the wrong way in a lot of ways. But there are really cool character interpretations kind of just hiding beneath the surface here, I think. Yeah, I'm just going to echo that again. Like, it, it's it's so... It's right there for the taking. And, like, you can see... It's almost like the there's, like, a sign like this is the path to prosperity, 56 miles, and they just go the other way. That's exactly right. All right, Chris, let's do it. It is time for us to talk about our dislikes. What's your first one? The dialogue is reprehensible. I mean, you explicitly have the R slur for mentally handicapped individuals thrown by our guy, Nick Fury. Um, you have every homophobic, misogynistic trope imaginable. Um, I don't know. These these dislikes are probably going to blend together, but like, I'm starting to have Mark Miller PTSD because as you do the research, you'd be hard-pressed to find a writer in comic books that has more on-screen adaptations and success in that regard. He wrote Kick. He did Jupiter Ascending or Jupiter Rising or what? What, what was the what was the one on Netflix? Uh, Jupiter's Legacy, uh, I believe. Jupiter's Legacy. He's he's so he's been like he's been successful, but at the same time, isn't this the same guy that wrote Aunt May being a scandalous woman in trouble? Yes, isn't sir. This. And so, like, I've heard so much love about, like, the Marvel Knights imprint and how it saved Marvel in the throes of bankruptcy. But he was spearheading that operation. So I have not visited Marvel Knights other than some of the Spider-Man stuff there. But the dialogue here... I hope this man has gone to therapy because there is so much deep-seated... Just awful stuff here. And it's it just made me feel gross and uncomfortable. Gross and uncomfortable summarizes so much of what is going on in this series. I wouldn't even know where to start, really. Um, I'm going to reserve some of this for one of my dislikes later, but I can only wholeheartedly echo that some of the dialogue is absolutely reprehensible. You are absolutely correct. And it was an uncomfortable read um, for sure. Um, which is weird because I remember in the early 2000s liking this a great deal more than I did this time. T- either times have changed or I have changed or something's changed because looking at the series now, it, the dialogue is really cringe-inducing. Uh, Dave, I I have word on, on the newswire that the Skrulls are firing, uh, filing a cease and desist. Your first dislike. You know, not just that, man. Okay, let's let's talk about the villains. So I'm sitting here and I'm reading this book, right? And the the main villains, the Chitari, don't even show up until like issue eight or nine out of thirteen. Like it, the, the story is incredibly meandering. Like here's a here's an issue where we introduce Captain America. Here's an issue where we introduce Iron Man. Here's an issue where we, you know, we introduce 
um, the Hulk. Here's an issue where we fish Captain America out of the out of the ice. And then, you know, after like six or seven issues, you're like, there is nothing happening. Who is the villain of this? Then we have an altercation with the Hulk, right? Um, but he is not the villain of, of this story, even though his behavior is absolutely reprehensible. More on that later. Um, but we're just going around in these circles around these characters and nothing is really happening. And then suddenly, boom, two thirds through the series, they're like, oop, here's a villain, you know? Um, and if you compare that to something and it's like... That, and, it's, and it's that convenient storytelling thing where, oh, they were the villains all along. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what's interesting, if you're looking at like... Um, the villain situation in the uh, the first Avengers movie, right? I mean, Loki pops up in the first five minutes or something. It's like, boom, here I am. I'm I'm the main bad guy for this movie, and then you know what the conflict is right off the off the bat. But this doesn't feel like there is a conflict right off the bat, except for these this, you know these personalities bumping against each other, you know. And that's all you really get for two thirds of the series. So the villains here are incredibly undercooked to the point where when you get to the finale and they're defeated, you feel nothing because they've not really been a part of the equation until much, much, much later in the series. So you have a 13-issue series, and they don't really show up to like issue 8 or 9. That was a really, really weird choice to me. Um, there's just no real central conflict that runs through the entirety of the story. Um, it more feels like the villains are introduced when they are because the series is about to be over. You know, So we, we need to have some kind of big showdown. So whoop, here's mystery villain that I just pulled out of my hat. It does not flow organically at all. And so um, the finale, which was supposed to be a big rah-rah, we saved the world moment, felt really incredibly flat to me. What's interesting is that this was, I want to say, four to six years before Secret Invasion. And so it had all the potential in the world. And I kind of did a double take because the Chitori are just like these big cockroach-looking aliens and they're just like mindless drivel cannon fodder uh, in in the 2012. And so like they leave a lot to be desired. And and Tom Hiddleston as Loki is doing all the work there as the adversary. But it's just it's just such a lazy storytelling aspect, in my opinion, that, oh, yeah, by the way, those Nazis, they were really just like you could have done so much more like even like laying that if you wanted to go that route you could have done you could have laid seeds of that growth and like callbacks to it um it just was not executed well you could have had you could have had things in you opened the first issue issue one in 1945 you could have had panels where and even even in the final battle like they don't really shape shift at all they just look humanoid 95 percent of the time and until, like, they eat their face, do you see anything different? Which, more on that later. Um, it's just so, such a strange choice to make. Um, and so, like, I found myself like, okay, like, this could be a cool thing. It was just executed so poorly. Yeah, it just wasn't going anywhere, man. All right, let's continue on with uh, your first big dislike of the series, second big dislike of the series, your next big dislike of the series. <laughs> it, um, I think I texted you. I was like, the, the name dropping, I'm so embarrassed for them. Like, the name dropping is so bad. Like, it goes out of its way to be stuck in 2002, 2003. I think it's very indicative um, and, you know, as as history buffs and lovers of history, you know, this is something that we immediately picked up on. It's such like a Patriot Act era, George Bush, Bush Cheney administration piece of literature. It's po very post 9-11, like this exterior threat. And we have to garner ourselves in this machismo and we're number one in the world and we're going to use all the testosterone and hormones in the world to defeat this unseen enemy. Um, and then you add to that fact, like name dropping, like Shannon Elizabeth and 
Freddie Prince Jr. Like, you know, in the Silver Age of Marvel, you have stuff like this in the background, but it's never this explicit. And it's almost like they're begging uh, to a certain extent. And it's just it's just pitiful, man. Yeah. Um, also, they had to hit us with some George W. Bush. Um, <laughs> oh, just explicitly George W. Bush. Like, there's no coming back from that. Yeah, it completely punched me in the face. I was ha- I was having flashbacks there for a second. I was like, "Holy crap, that's George God. W. Bush." Um, yeah, it, there's so and, much and, name and like dropping. Like older comics, older comics are smart about it. They put like a silhouette of the president. You can you can suggest heavily that it's Reagan in the '80s, but like, come on, you're you're tying you're handcuffing yourself here. The, the it does come across. Um, I think it does come across incredibly dated in that respect, right? I think there is um, there is definitely a sense that this is not some kind of like timeless story. It is incredibly stuck in its time period. Uh, we even got some Cameron Diaz name drops. I think like there was so much dropping of names going on, and I am um, I don't know, man. Like it just didn't. It, it it dates it. I think for one, it is incredibly a product of its time. Um, with with very little that you know like i i know that you cannot remove this story in any way shape or form from the context of its time period like there is no way without having the context of the early 2000s that you can realistically sit down and just enjoy the story because there are so many references in there like shannon who you know, like you, you just—it's not the girl, not the hottie clip. from American Pie, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well. Yeah. 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 He's on. A, he's he's you. just floating around in space with her. Yeah, because a, as you do, you know, for funsies. Now, again, Hitch's art was actually really good in in that in that splash page because I was like, holy crap, it really does look like like Shannon Elizabeth back then. That's so, I mean, I'm like, well, wow, um, that was a really good likeness. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just incredibly, it, it really, really dates itself. I could go on for ages about this, Dave, but go ahead, because I think this is probably the most egregious. Well, no, it's the dialogue, but the second most egregious thing about this entire 13 issue run. Bruce Banner, the Hulk, is absolutely atrocious in this story to an extent that is almost difficult to wrap your head around. I hate this version of the Hulk so, so much. As Bruce Banner, he is not just a meek nerd, but sort of this 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 incredibly unlikable, sniveling, um I I want to yeah, loser. Like I want to be respected because I'm a smart guy, but I accomplish nothing and everybody's mean to me. But my God, would it be hard not to be mean to this guy considering like at one point Thor's like, hey, you know, I, I have all your secrets, you know, in your head. You you dream about hurting uh Hank and, 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 and Janet Pym because they took your spot. You know, like and you're like, Holy smokes, man. Ugh, that's that's yucky. And when he becomes the Hulk. Don't even get me started. I I think at this point, if this is what it sounds like when a Hulk talks, I prefer when he just says Hulk smash. Because every single thing that you said about the dialogue is just hyper-focused and concentrated in the Hulk. Every word that comes out of his mouth is absolutely cringe-inducingly disgusting and you just oh my god you don't want to think about any words that come out of the hulk and the the one you know right at the end that sort of was the coup de gras the the cherry on top of the absolute poop sandwich that is this interpretation (laughs) of the character is when uh, Captain America says, "You see the pi- the pilots of these spaceships. They, ca- they Hulk. They all say you're a sissy boy." And Hulk yells in oh. really huge font, "Hulk straight!" And then pr- proceeds to tear up all the spaceships. And I'm just like, this is without a doubt the single worst interpretation of the Hulk character that I have ever seen in my 40 years on this Earth. And may I never have to see this version of the Hulk. Ever, ever, ever again. It's so bad, and and I I I I'm proud of myself because I didn't spoil it um, when we were talking about your undercooked villains. But the simple fact that four or five issues in, he 
transforms intentionally into the Hulk, kills hundreds of people just to get create like this bonding experience for the rest of the Ultimates. Uh, thoughts and prayers go to Freddie Prince Jr., whom I love and adore. But um, this is character assassination on another level. <laughs> because it's, it's, yeah, your girlfriend that you're separated from is on a date with Freddie Prince Jr., and that is that's your trigger. Like it's it's oh god, it's so bad. It's the worst. It, it's absolutely the worst. Um. That brings us to your third and final dislike, Chris. Let's go ahead and uh, get this out of the way. Everybody's naked! <laughs> Why is everybody just naked? Like, come on. Okay. Here's the here's the crazy thing, Type. There is... Um, there is... Uh, Explicit spousal abuse, domestic abuse going on in this comic book in a way that is wholly uncomfortable. And uh, we haven't even broached that topic yet. Nope. Hank and I'm Janet, going to, don't worry. <laughs> Hank and Janet just absolutely laying into each other, her having to shrink down to hide from him, only to be abused by his aunts. But don't worry, because she's naked and the shape-shifting alien that's been an alien since 1945 took over infiltrated the nazi regime and that's why adolf hitler was as bad as it was that's not lazy storytelling at all adolf hitler was just awful okay he was just awful you don't have to explain that away with an alien invasion but he was naked too <laughs> everybody was naked god everybody's naked and i'm not a prude i'm not a prude you want to you want to start an only fans you want to start an only fans babe that's great but not inexplicably naked how do you take down a villain janet van dyne janet pym flash them just show them your boobs that's how you do it you literally took down a villain by flashing them Girls Gone Wild Ultimates Edition. Like, just, oh my god. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that uh, once I edit this episode, I will probably either name it Ultimate Everybody's Naked or Ultimate Naked Hitler. I, th- I, th- I think those are the episode names on the table right now. <laughs> I don't know. We'll after, after, after Toad Turds, I don't know if we can come <laughs> back from that. I, I I fully I fully endorsed the toad, toad turd episode. I can't even say it this week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what what can I even say? It's a very um, pardon my French, but it's a very horny book. Like there there's a lot of naked people, and uh, literally, your boy Hulk says Hulk horny. <laughs> yeah, I mean that the entire Hulk rampage is just Hulk trying to get himself some uh, from from Betty Ross. That's like the whole that's like the whole reason he's rampaging. Holy Lord, uh, Gwen Stacy has uh, bequeathed her character assassination from JMS uh, because the Betty Ross character assassination here is just criminal. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have some stuff to say there. Okay, let's just jump straight into it, Dave. Your final dislike, because everybody is a character from the boys, apparently. Everybody's a butthole in this book. I mean... Um... And it's not that's not the terminology I used in our Google Doc, but everybody in this book is a butthole. Everybody. Everybody. Even the characters that have hints of likability are buttholes. Tony Stark has a likable streak, absolutely. Also wants to do an interview while he's hovering in space with Shannon Elizabeth. Dude's a butthole. Thor is incredibly condescending to people. Do I like, you know, his causes? Absolutely. Do I like how he puts things sometimes? Absolutely not. Dude's a butthole. Hank Pym, you know, you want to talk about character assassination? Hank Pym has never been a great character in the comic books, but at least he's not been the guy. There are hints hints of domestic abuse in the 616, but never to this extent. Uses bug spray on the wasp. And then when she's shrunk down, six a bunch of ants on her to try to eat her alive. Um, 
And you know, it's funny because in the last couple of covers, he actually shows up on the cover like he is For in what? this big battle. With, like he's yes! in this big battle, and he's yes! not, he's he's gone, right? Um, Captain America. Captain he's at America. his what was it? He's at his mom's in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, Cap Captain America. I love the Captain America character. Always have. I love Captain That's America. The most, ba- this is the most egregious. This is the most egregious one. He, he's he's basically Marvel Superman as far as like you know morality and stuff. Mm-hmm. And and this this guy is a jerk. Like he is just a jerk. I don't know how else to put this. Uh, the one of the most infamous panels of him pointing at his A on his head and his and says, "What do you think this stands for, France?" I just wanted to throw my iPad across the room. It's just such such an off kilter way of of portraying this character. He's old fashioned. He's not a jerk. You know, the Hulk we've already talked about extensively, right? But then you get into some of the some of the side characters too, like like Betty Ross, who ends the book literally turned on by the Hulk. Yes, e- eating people, cannibalizing. And- and once, cannibalism, and once, and once to set up a conjugal visit, I, I, it's just, you know, it, it's arguable. You know, she treats him incredibly badly when they're first having interactions at the beginning of the book, and it's almost, it's almost possible to say that the way the character is portrayed, she was hoping he would get off, go off the deep end because she likes it, um, and that is incredibly weird. Like, there's, it's just so full of of weird stuff. And what in the world did they do with the wasp here? Now, now correct me if I'm wrong because you're you're a resident mutant expert, but the wasp in the 616 is not a mutant, right? No. Yeah. So here she is a mutant who randomly lays eggs in the bed. Um and and Hank Pym really has a problem with that apparently. Um she has a healthy dose Not of, enough uh, to like not marry her. Like Yeah. She has an unhealthy dose of self-loathing. Um and completely goes off on 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 Captain America when he tries to bring her some soda to the hospital. Um, like a none bottle of, these of soda, people, a bottle of soda, which is yeah, you know, what can I say? What's better than a bottle of soda? <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Roses man. and soda. This is so two thousand two. Oh my god. I got nothing, man. Like, there is not a single likable person in this book. No. Bucky Barnes, Bucky Barnes, when he figures out Captain America's dead, turns around and marries Captain America's fiance. He's Bucky Barnes. <laughs> I, I need to beep this. Give me a second. <laughs> I don't know what to say anymore. Like, there is no. There is not a single likable person in this entire book. Oh. It's like half a step removed from the boys. Like, I can't root for anybody yeah. here. They're all terrible people. And I think that's the most egregious thing about this, you know? Yeah. There is not a single person that I want to root for in this. It's just uncomfortable. Everybody sucks in this book. Everybody sucks. <laughs> I think that's... And I think that's such like a tone deaf thing too because the reason the captain america works or when you have these strong moral characters is because they're juxtaposed against pragmatic people or quote-unquote realistic people but when you don't have that basis it falls flat there's no system of measurement your compass is just spinning around and around and around. You have no sense of direction. Because if everyone's awful, what's the point? It's such a cynical book. It's it's it was such a depressing read. Um Yeah, I, I'm just it and the fact that the only reason that they were able to win is because he unleashes the Hulk and gaslights him the whole time with like the most homophobic language imaginable without using slurs is just disgusting and reprehensible like i said yeah it's it's, this one was exhausting yeah 
This was you imagine you imagine my shock and awe upon reading this because I had an overwhelmingly positive experience reading uh, the latter parts of these characters' history, and then this was this was a this was like a sniffing salts. It was almost like Captain America kidnapped me and tied me to a chair because that's what this Captain America would do, apparently. Yeah, this was exhausting, man. Except he would be naked. <laughs> Everybody's naked. Inexplicably naked. That's the thing. If you have, you know, you have the foremost scientific geniuses, but they cannot invent a uniform that shrinks with you. Mm-mm. New did he. Yeah. Is this an AI-generated hub comic? Like, is that just what it is? <laughs> I, 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 I think so. <laughs> I don't know what else to say anymore. I'm I'm exhausted. Um, so f- f- <laughs> final grade, Chris. Uh boo. it's an F. I'm sorry. Nope. 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 What about you? I D minus just for the art. It was at least pretty to look at. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. I'm just, we get Thor I'm just, a better wig. If we get Thor a better wig, I'm willing to go there. But oh. Jesus, man, those thunder! It does have great splash pages, and it has great action scenes. Okay, so maybe I'll graduate it to a D. Okay, it's it's really funny too because it's very cinematic. Like, but I'm writing. Like, okay, it's a D. It's a D, but I'm writing an officer referral, and I'm hoping that they get at least a day of ISS for this dialogue. <laughs> yep. 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 You know, it, it's it's a very cinematic looking book, right? Like it looks it looks You great. can see why it was inspired by that. Like even in the first few pages, like the the Gale thing, you could see it, that's immediately Peggy. Immediately you could see it. Um it's just like maybe if this was a silent comic book, maybe it was one of those Nuff said initiative, it'd be perfect. Holy smokes, man. All right, let's you know what, let's just move on and talk about something we actually like. Uh yes. ladies and gentle people. Let's it's let's go ahead and, and, and do this. Uh, find us on social media if you'd like to tell us how you feel about the ultimates. Do you think it still holds up or did you have a similar icky experience as Chris and I? You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at nerd by word and individually at that nerd Dave and at that nerd Chris. Now let's take a break, a deep breather. And get back to something we really enjoy, like, let's say, nerd commendations. So stick around. We're back. And after a much-deserved break, it is time for us to discuss something we actually really like in this week's... All right, Chris, hit me with something good, please. Dude, I know that I've nerd commended this run before, but technically it has a new writer. So, uh, I mean, you're doing a 2.0 nerd commendation, so I'm going to follow your lead here. But the current Thor comics by Torin Gronbeck uh, and Nick Klein is is just like peak Thor comics, man. Like, it's crazy when I sit and think about it, because I'm also reading like the, the Walt Simonson run. We've talked to a good extent about the Jason Aaron run. I recommended Johnny Donny Cates's run. We've never had like bad Thor comics, um, and you know sometimes he gets kind of forgotten in the shuffle of the Avengers comics. But this is great stuff, man. Like, um, I'm not sure what's going on with Donny Cates if he's kind of taken a sabbatical. I haven't, you know, really kept up with the gossip and everything of the comic book community. Uh, but Torin, uh, Torin Grombeck, she has taken over the writing responsibilities for the most part of this title. I think he was credited, Kites was credited with like an assist uh, on a recent issue. But like she's she's hit the ground running, man. I think she's also writing like the Valkyrie stuff and the Jane Foster comics. So I'm definitely going to check those out because I have enjoyed these so much. Like they're they're pulling out all the stops of like um, the best parts of like the Thor comics in the past of where you've got like kind of non-linear storytelling telling you've got uh flashbacks flash forwards uh past thor and odin stuff you've got future thor stuff it's really really great you've got thanos storylines you've got dr doom in here um the the valkyrie and like the mcuification um yeah you know so you have a valkyrie that bears a likeness um 
to Tessa Thompson. It's just great storytelling, man. And um, it's just really good comics. And then Nick Klein's art um, and even the fill in artists are just, are just fantastic. So um, I, this is one of those things is like, as soon as Wednesday rolls around, I'm looking, did Thor release this week? Uh, it's just good stuff. And I cannot recommend uh, Thor comics enough right now. Yeah, uh, then I'm going to definitely follow you there because you've not given me a bad Thor recommendation yet. Um, uh, I have I have to say everything you've recommended Thor wise that I've read, I've absolutely loved. So I'm going to I'm going to follow you to this one, man. All right. I want to follow you, but I'm going to have to take out a second job for it, though, because you got a you got another follow up nerd commendation, my friend. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to go ahead and uh, kind of revisit a nerd commendation that I did a few weeks ago when I first got um, my Steam Deck. Um, now that I have had a lot more time with it, I've sunk about forty five or fifty hours into the machine on various games. I've started, you know, looking under the hood a little bit more. I've started learning to do certain things with it, and I have to say, uh, after you know the initial enthusiasm wore off, a new enthusiasm took hold because this machine is absolutely incredible, Chris. Um, it, it continues to blow my mind uh, how much power is under the hood um, and all the things you can do with it if you are willing to tinker. I think um, the number one requirement, I think, really of, of enjoying the Steam Deck is, is the willingness to tinker. Um, I think you can get it out of the box and just have it as is, and it's fine. But if you're willing to tinker around a little bit with it, you are going to be blown away. Um, so uh, just a few things. So this this runs a custom operating system called Steam OS that is Linux-based. In order to be able to run um, PC games on it, which is what Steam is all about, you're using um, a compatibility layer basically called Proton. There are different versions of, of Proton and um, depending on how the game runs on the Steam Deck under one, you may need to switch to another um, in order to get better compatibility. Now, how in the world would you know whether a game runs well on the Steam Deck? Well, uh, Steam has a program where they basically label their games, you know, Steam Deck verified. It's, you know, it's perfect, it's playable, it doesn't really work, whatever. But that's not always 100% accurate. So the wonderful thing about the Steam Deck is how many fans are involved in making this the best experience possible. So there is a website called ProtonDB where uh, fans actually go on there and they log their experiences with a game and what they did to make it work, right? And so you can actually get a plugin for your Steam Deck that you put put on it, and then every game that you look at on your Steam Deck will have the badge from ProtonDB on it, whether fans have had positive or negative experiences playing it. And you can click on the badge and it tells you exactly what they did to make it work, which version of Proton they, they ran it in, um, what kind of controller setup they configured if there wasn't a good one you know, out of the box. Um, you can download uh, controller configuration. So people are like, okay, this is how I did the button layout and I'm putting it out there because it works really well. And you can download and apply those. So if you're willing to tinker a little bit, this thing becomes an even better experience. Um, I've, I've learned a lot about, um, you know, changing settings on this thing to make it run more efficiently. I have started playing around with the concept of emulation on it. Emulators are interesting, right? Um, and this thing can handle almost anything you throw at it in the emulation realm as well, uh, which is absolutely mind blowing. The kind of things you can actually run on the steam deck. Um, it's got so much power under the hood, man. And so my next thing uh, now is probably uh, that I'm looking at actually buying a, a new hard drive for it. And I'm strongly considering opening it up and upgrading the hard drive in it because space is at a premium with some of these games. Um, but it's just a really, really cool machine. Um, very well supported uh, by, by Valve. Um, very, very uh, great community uh, that has come up around this. People developing plugins for it. Uh, you can uh, download like um, a, a theme manager and you can actually change the layout of how the, the game grid looks on it and stuff. There are so, so many things you can do with it. It's basically like a switch if it were powerful and customizable and a whole bunch of fans are constantly improving it because Nintendo, there's not no Nintendo to come after them every time they try to make something better. It's an absolute joy of a machine and it is completely 
revolutionized how I play video games. Um, and I've spent a lot of time just playing around with it and learning about it and all the things it can do. My next big goal, uh, which is going to be a project I'm going to do probably over the next week or two, is there are some um, there's some software that you can put on it that allows you to game stream from various consoles. So there's one where you can stream from PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 to your Steam Deck, um, as long as you're on the same you know internet connection. And then there's one that does the same thing uh, for Xbox, which will open up my entire um, you know Game Pass uh, situation on my Steam Deck, so I can be anywhere in my house and I can play my Xbox on my Steam Deck, which is just absolutely mind blowing to me. So th- this machine has completely changed the way I game. It is my my favorite console. I mean, it's really a handheld gaming PC, but it is my favorite console that I've bought in a dog's age. It's absolutely just changed everything. And it is my favorite way to play games now. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that because there's, you know, there's so many Xbox stuff that I've, I've nerd commended and you haven't been able to, to capitalize on. But, but that, so that last feature is very exciting. Uh, we're gonna have to change your name to like the Tinkerer man because you love you love tinkering. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I'm a bi- I'm a I'm a big tech nerd, and I love playing with technology. We started with like your Game Boy kind of remodel, revitalization, restor- restoration is the word I'm looking for, and so now I'm, I'm sensing a trend here. But I'm I'm very excited for you because I know that you've missed gaming. Um, I have with, with the busy the busy life that you lead, and so like this is this is just happy news all around. Yeah, it's and it just I, I you know I don't even know what to say. It's just such a, a worthy investment if you are a gamer. It does not get better than the Steam Deck right now, especially if if you don't mind, you know, learning about technology because this thing can do so many things that I had no idea about that I'm still learning. Um, and there will probably be a Steam Deck Nerd Commendation 3.0 once I've set up some more <laughs> stuff on it. I think we're going to have to check in later again with with what else I figure out about the machine. But it is it is a joy. It absolutely is a joy, Chris. All righty, folks, there you have it. That's uh, episode 151 of the Nerd by Word podcast. If you like what you just heard, you need to get on your favorite podcasting platform. Don't hesitate. Do it. Do it right now. And uh, give us a rating, a review, and subscribe so you never miss another episode. You can find us on pretty much every podcasting platform of ad imaginable. And, of course, on our very own website, nerdbyword.com. And I want to go ahead and also give a quick shout out to a new accessibility feature we have just been able to add. Uh, we now have um, we now have our transcript available as part of our episode, and we're pushing that all out uh, across the various podcasting networks. Um, and uh, on top of that, we've also added it to our episodes on our website. Uh, these transcripts are not 100% perfect. We have to use some automated systems to create them because, well, uh, it would be a, a lot of time investment to type up over an hour worth of episode every week. However, uh, they are really quite good. And so if you'd like to read along with some of the things we are saying, um, then this is definitely a feature for you. And be sure to hit us up on socials. You can find us at Nerd by Word on Twitter and Instagram, that Nerd Dave and that Nerd Chris individually as well. Uh, be sure to interact with us. Hit the link in our socials, slide into our Discord, buy some cool merch. And as always, most importantly, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd by Word is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Thank you.